It's Friday, and that means two things here at Zogby Strategies. The first is that the lawnmower next door to me uh, has just started, uh, and every uh, broadcast that we've had thus far during the warm weather months, that lawnmower has been going. So I'm in direct competition with my neighbor's yard. The second is that this is another edition of the Zogby Report, real and unscripted where my son and partner Jeremy and I get to have some fun and have a civil conversation over very serious issues facing our country. Hi, Jer, how are you doing this week? You know, I'm doing pretty well. And um, recently it's been brought to my attention that uh, we have a listener who, who I think is a, a very, very special listener. I was just told about this a few days ago. I only know her as Nana. Uh, and apparently Nana just got her first internet connection within like a few weeks ago and she tunes into the Zogby report and she's getting caught up with the episodes. This is somebody, if my math is correct, was born in 1928 and is here wow. uh, listening with us in 2021. So she's seen a lot and she's a big fan. And I have to say that I am uh, completely humbled and, and grateful for that. So, so thank you, Nana. Thank you, Nana. Hi, how are you? And I want to point out before we get started that um, we get a, we get quite a few comments. Uh, there are two last week that were partic uh, particularly noteworthy. One is from a longtime colleague and friend, Paul Cowley, who uh, listens or watches um, every week. And last week, um, he wrote about how the importance of the topic, the seriousness of the topic, that was, as you recall, uh, about infrastructure. But also, uh, he loves the repartee between you, you and me, and uh, especially um, uh, marvels at your knowledge of, um, of ancient history and your ability to weave that fascinating uh, era uh, into our conversations. And so thanks, Paul. And um, we'll be talking soon, I'm sure. Uh, and then also uh, a regular listener, uh, Michael Carmichael, who said that uh, what we talked about last week is rarely talked about. Very important question that we asked. And, and that is, you know, can this national community be built uh, can we survive as one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all? And he said he didn't have an answer, and obviously we didn't either, but uh, that it was important that we opened up that conversation. So Paul and Michael, thank you very much. And so here we go. You ready? Yeah. All right. Voting rights. Uh, Paul Cowley uh, actually communicated with me directly and, and, and asked us to get into this issue. And of course, it's a very important one. So let me uh, set the, the table on this one. On the surface, what we're looking at is legislation in almost every state to, uh, in the words of the Republicans, um, tighten up the voting process, which they feel has gone askew become disorganized and become um, uh, a mess, uh, allowing some people to vote uh, and others not to vote and to enable, um, in their words, uh, some significant amounts of fraud on the county levels and on the state levels. And so uh, in each case, each state, they see their legislation as actually a tightening up of the voting process to make sure that, in their words, that it's fair, but also, in their words, that it, it goes by a, a standard set of rules that applies to everyone, no favoritism. Um, Democrats, on the other hand, take a look uh, at it, and, they, uh, and then they see these multi-states uh, Re voting uh, reform packages, uh, to put it bluntly, is racist. That uh, this tightening up process, this limiting of days that can vote, 
limiting of behavior in um, in voting lines, uh, limiting putting placing tighter limits on vote by mail uh, and eligibility standards. They see that as uh, clear uh, uh, attempts to dampen turnout among people of color, most especially American blacks. They liken this voting rights legislation <clears throat> to Jim Crow and to <clears throat> efforts um, you know, from the era of Plessy versus Ferguson, the 1890s on up to the 1960s is a clear cut effort to limit uh, black voting. It ultimately led to the 1965 Civil Rights Act, um, which Voting Rights Act too, which uh, eliminated poll taxes, um, reading tests, uh, grandfather's clauses, and so on. And so there is a moral element to this argument uh, are these state laws designed to limit the number of blacks? And then there's obviously a, a political element to all of this, knowing that the Democrats receive generally 90 plus percent of the black vote. And so every black vote lost pretty much is a black law vote lost or a vote lost for the Democrats. <clears throat> um, I will take the lead and say <clears throat> that these, uh, these attempts at reforming voting laws in all of these states is racist. Um, that it is uh, an attempt by a Republican party, which even though is gerrymandered into uh, a lot of safe districts and a capacity to win elections is an effort to not only stem the number of black votes, but keep the Republican Party alive because the black vote, the non-white vote uh, is, is growing. So I, I see these efforts as, um, as reprehensible, uh, as racist, uh, as transparent, and frankly, as troubling to the future of our democracy. Yeah. What do you think? Well, you know, I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> to be fair and, and to infuse both a combination of current and history into this is necessary. But I mean, remember this, if you make the case that Republicans want to, to limit black voters, I think, and, and that, you know, you, you can make the case and starting off by saying that this, this whole agenda is racist. And then you then pre present the evidence as they want to limit black voters. That's kind of uh, maybe a contradiction or a weak argument because we're at a point, we've been at a point in this nation where every vote counts. I mean, this goes back to 2000. I mean, look how many elections since 2000 have been razor thin. And what we've seen since 2016 is the Republicans actually making headway into the black community. We saw that in 2020. We saw that in, in our poll of 600 uh, likely black voters where those 18 to 24 year old black voters voted, uh, w were saying they would vote for Trump. The percentage was like over one third, over 33%. That is a, a very key demographic uh, that can be excited and could make the difference in, a, in, in an election. Why would a party shoot themselves in the foot by, by limiting that and, and thus ensuring that in the midterms and in 2024, they're going to lose? So when, when Democrats say that uh, Republicans are, are trying to limit uh, uh, black voters, uh, that's a very weak argument because the Republicans clearly especially in the last couple of years, have made gains into the black community. Um, you know, on the, uh, an another thing that Democrats say is they point to examples in some states of um, uh, requiring IDs uh, when you show up to the poll. 
and they say that you know that that's just a long call back to like what you were talking about um literacy tests and and things like that and you know i've heard an interesting argument where people who who criticize democrats they say well that's racist i mean it's kind of racist to assume that minorities and um particularly african americans don't carry I forms of id with them i mean if you drive right you carry a driver's license with you if you go to the store chances are you have some kind of state uh id on you so i mean to to make that charge and say if if they want ids to 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 be presented at the polls therefore that's jim crow that could work against them and and that's kind of just like your typical uh, Democrat white paternalism. So let uh, so let me comment on, on two of things that you you noted. First of all, this most recent argument. Um, we have never been in a situation where we have had to present ID at the at the polls, um, and so this notion of presenting ID is an effort to single out the fact that the over the last 20 years, and increasingly in, in numbers and percentages, black voters are turning out. Um, it wasn't broke, so don't fix it. And it ain't broke now, so don't fix it. And for the uh, the side-by-side -side argument that we have to stem levels of, of voter fraud, you, you know as, as well as I do that despite the fact that uh, John Fund, longtime columnist for the uh, for the Wall Street Journal and somebody I, I consider a friend of mine has written extensively about voter fraud in elections, particularly on the Democratic side, but has not really offered any compelling evidence of how that is endemic and takes place widely throughout the, uh, the country. And so there's no need for IDs and why all of a sudden, with the growth of the black vote, do we need it? The second point that you you brought up was that, yes, we did that poll of 600 uh, uh, blacks nationwide, and we did see 33% of young black men, um, and that's what the, what the figure was, indicating that they would vote for Trump. On election day, it was... Um, uh, it was 19%, which is high, of 18 to 29-year-old black men who voted for Trump. By the same token, it was 97% of young black women uh, that voted for Joe Biden. So all in all, what came out in the wash was that Joe Biden got 94% of the, of the black vote. There were not as many young black men who turned out to vote as there were young black women who turned out to vote. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it just, it begs the question, are, are the Republicans really, are, are they, are they so racist and blind that they're willing to, to shoot themselves in the foot yet? We talked about a few weeks ago, you know, um, when, when uh, Juneteenth was officially made a holiday, uh, 514, I think it was, maybe even higher, uh, members of Congress voted to pass Juneteenth as a federal holiday. And so what we saw in a unique situation was the coming together of two parties on, on something that's part of this, this wider discussion of race and racism. And less than one, doing the math, less than 1% of, of members of Congress voted against it. We could get inside of their heads and we could say they're, they're old Confederate, you know, uh, 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 wizards in the closet or, or, or KKK members in the closet, or we could say that, I don't know, maybe some of them just were, were reading uh, their constituents and understood that they were against it. And so they voted against it to represent their constituents. Regardless, it was about 1% of Congress. So we can come to agreement with the fact that on a very important issue that, that is tied into race and racism, we saw 99% unity in Congress. And so now we're back to saying the Republican Party is racist. I mean, it's just, it happens on both sides. You know, uh, the Republicans say that the, the Democrats are all communists. 
the Democrats fire back and, and say that they're all racist. And it's what it is, is it's labeling and it, 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 it's 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 contentious debate and it prioritizes attack over listening and understanding and empathy. And that's really I, the, I've the got main a different problem. take on that vote. And that is the, the just knowing a little bit about politics, having followed it and been involved in it for a while, that that comes under the category that vote for on Juneteenth as to picking your battles. You know, when you've got <clears throat> a whole array of issues that let's say are life and death issues. Uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about uh, infrastructure and <clears throat> another budget shutdown, um, uh, guns, uh, abortion, uh, a whole myriad of issues that are wedge issues between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, it, it makes all the sense in the world for a Republican congressman, even in a lily white district, to say, you know something, this is not worth battling over. Uh, giving a holiday is not giving anything. Giving in on infrastructure is uh, is a problem for me uh, with my constituents or or with my caucus. So I will kind of disagree with you. Well, that's fine, that but I mean, I, I just I, I think we need to be careful in 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 uh, perpetuating these charges um, and and that and labeling an entire party racist uh, when I, I mean. Can we really say that? I, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if, if somebody wants to say that, they're more than welcome to say that. But Well, what's the argument then? I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, no, um, I, 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 truthfully, I, all I want to say is it's too convenient. It's just too convenient to, to say. I mean, it would, it would be better to say that it's, it's, it's unconstitutional. It would be better to say that it's, it's not right. But, but these hypercharged terms that happen on both sides were oh, all the Democrats are communists. They hate this country. They want to flood the, the country. And then, well, all the Republicans are white supremacists, domestic terrorists. We, we have to really get beyond that. It's very sophomoric. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, no, that's my word. Um, but anyway, look, I don't like the, the hyper-partisanship and the labeling. I'm just trying, I'm struggling here with what is the motive of passing uh, the, these voting uh, laws except to perpetuate Republican control in those states. And if you're perpetuating Republican control, therefore you are perpetuating what is in effect, and I think admittedly, almost an entirely white party. And when you, you parse some of these um, state bills, and, and some now, Texas, for example, state laws, and you see that the impact on them is um, clearly designed to, to dampen the vote of blacks, much the same way as the poll tax and the literacy tests and, and so on. If the impact is to limit the black vote, and it is such as because that black vote jeopardizes Republican control, then no, I don't think you have to wear a hood and a white robe or burn a cross or use egregious racist language to say that the impact of that is discriminatory. And that's where I'm coming at with the charge of racism. If it, if it is discriminating against black voters, then, you know, it's racist. It walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Well, it just goes back to the, the point that I think the whole argument is missed when, when the, the first <clears throat> step is to label it something awful, right? To, to go in for the jugular. I think the larger problem and the larger argument is that we are in a situation where both parties, number one, are at war with each other. Both parties distrust each other deeply. 
and both parties have cried foul play. Back in 2016, the Democrats, remember, Donald Trump was the, by my estimation, was the first president who did not get a presidential honeymoon. There was, there was war waged from day one. There was, there was, by my estimation, misinformation, disinformation pushed in lockstep across the, the corporate media um, that he was unfairly elected. They, they made the charge before producing the evidence. They did produce evidence, but I'm not so sh sure that it was necessarily convincing, but yet they pushed the narrative that he was a false president. And then here we are now in 2020, and the same thing is happening. Both parties are at war with each other. So that's how we understand the backdrop of this, of this power struggle and of, of this um, deep divide in the nation. And to up front and center uh, start the debate with, with, with name calling and charges, I, I think is just pouring fuel on the flame. I think we need to see it for what it is. Both parties want to take control for a generation and, mm -hmm. and both parties have deemed each other illegitimate happened last election, happened in this election. Um, yeah, I, look, um, no argument from me when it comes to um, uh, the, the, uh, the treatment of, of Donald Trump. I mean, he egged the press on. They had this, um, this wonderful symbiotic relationship where they actually fed off of each other and, and hence got press got wonderful ratings. Um, but I totally agree that uh, by not uh, giving Donald Trump uh, a honeymoon, by going after him right from the very beginning, the press lost a lot of credibility. Instead of being adversarial, which is its role, it became oppositional, uh, which is not its role. You know, so uh, when you wake up every morning and you turn the TV on, which incidentally I don't do, but when you do, uh, either daily or rarely, and the first thing you see is, you should see what he did last night. You should see what he wrote on Twitter. You should see, and then you go to the panel, and the panel says, this is ugly and awful and reprehensible. Then you're crying wolf. And when something really egregious is done, as opposed to is said or is tweeted, you kind of lose all credibility in your analysis. I'm totally with you on yeah. that. And then that's somebody from somebody who's not a fan of Donald Trump, but somebody who says, hey, he won the election, get over it. Yeah. So, I mean, it just it, it just goes back to my view that it, it's both parties. Both parties distrust each other. Yep. Both parties charge each other with, with awful, horrible things. And um, it, it's it's just another example of, of trying to vilify the other side and, and making one side look like the good guy and, and the other, the, the bad guy. And it happens both ways. And we need to understand that. But, you know, I, I actually, I kind of anticipated a different discussion today. Um, you know, um, this goes beyond uh, since Biden being inaugurated and pretty much from day one, uh, pushing a narrative of, of that, that this country is, is succumbing to right-wing domestic terrorists and um, uh, proposals for legislation that, that you know, could be interpreted as you know, around the corner pre-crime type uh, stuff. Or you heard this from, from Facebook, if, if, you, if you see your neighbor becoming an, ex an extremist, report it. And, and we've been moving more in this direction of, I think, a dangerous uh, trend towards towards vilification, but there's a whole new level to that. And what I what I thought we were going to talk about, and this is under the banner of COVID nineteen, is recently uh, Joe Biden was I think he was finishing up with a press conference, and a, a reporter asked him about a pandemic, and he went right up to the camera. And he said, the only pandemic is among the unvaccinated. They're killing people. And so that's the new vilification now. It's not so much the right wing domestic terrorists, although I think that's a major discussion. Now we're seeing a narrative emerge over the last couple of weeks of a, a blame the unvaccinated, by the way, which are about 50 percent 
of the population, if you go by the CDC's uh, reporting as of July 15th, and I have some some deep concern about that narrative um, that's that I'm seeing increasingly over these couple of weeks that that it's the unvaccinated that are 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 creating uh, the next pandemic and that uh, going so far as to say that they're killing people and that's coming from our president uh, that that's something I I think we should have on our radar if not talk about next week because that that has some eerie resemblances of some. Uh, modern historical analogies. So I do want to talk about this in depth um, next week. Um, I will say, however, that if 97% of the new cases um, of of COVID uh, Delta um, uh, variant uh, are among the unvaccinated, um, then the that's that's very compelling evidence. Yeah, now, number one, it does not mean that if you're vaccinated, you're 100% clear. Um, there are the various break that uh, are, are, are taking place, but it's minuscule compared to those who are vaccinated. And so the question that we'll leave on the table, um, are unvaccinated, I'm sorry, but the, the, the question that I'll leave on the table for next week is, uh, is my responsibility only to myself or is my responsibility as well to the broader communi- community? In other words, um, hey, if I want to, nobody can, uh, if I want to ride a motorcycle, without a helmet, that's my right to do, and you can't tell me not to. However, if a truck hits me and splatters me in a thousand different directions, then why should the rest of the community have to pay to pick up my body parts and and my scattered brains? Um, Is there not a, a, a broader impact here beyond what's good for me. Uh, And that's the situation. How do we get to herd uh, immunity when we still have 50% of us who are unvaccinated to prove a point? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess the questions I want to ask for next week is, is, you know, we saw uh, from uh, February and March when the pandemic started uh, ramping up, and, and months following, we saw a lot of numbers thrown out there, a lot of numbers and data which had been retracted. Uh, a lot of people felt like the goalposts were being moved. And so in, in, in such a quick time period to come up with that data of 97%, I, I guess I'd like to see, I'd like to see some transparency behind how that data is collected and, and how they come to to uh, to that conclusion so quickly. I mean, we're only talking about a couple of weeks. How, how do they gather that, and how do they come to that conclusion? And um, I, you know, I'd like to address uh, uh, what you're talking about as well. Okay, um, that sounds good. So we'll we'll call it a day. But um, I'll end on on my final note, which is I'm very troubled by the uh, vote limitation bills that I'm seeing in in all of these states. Um, And to me, at least, uh, the impact of those are clear, regardless of um, how I label it or or not. That's very troubling. Last word as always. Uh, Have a good week. (laughs) I'm gonna try. I'll see you a little later, I love you. Love you too.